All righty, welcome everyone. We're gonna get started right on time. I'm gonna share my screen while everyone kind of takes a moment to filter in and say hello. Beautiful. So welcome, my name is Carrie McGinn. On behalf of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare and Tufts Health Plan, I'm really happy to present Making Lasting Connections. I'm gonna be going through a lot of different things today. If you have questions throughout, feel free to pop it in the chat. I'll periodically check, but otherwise I'll leave just a few moments at the end for any questions um, or comments if necessary. So thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you for joining in and thank you just for hanging in there. So making lasting connections. We're gonna talk a little bit about what is a lasting connection, some of the benefits, why you might not be creating them, important qualities to have and look for, and just a little bit about communication styles and personality. So I was still decent amount of research on this just to make sure I was bringing you all the most kind of up-to-date information and just kind of diving into this from a lot of different angles. And I came across a couple of quotes that I'm gonna share with you throughout our session today. So when it comes to making lasting connections, something that kept coming up was this idea. Be genuinely interested in everyone you meet and everyone you will meet will be genuinely interested in you. So I just wanna leave that there with you for a moment to kind of reflect on what that would mean to you, what that would look like to you, how would that would feel almost to you. So I always like to start with a definition of kind of what we are diving into, because I think it gives us a lot of good information about where we're going and why. So what does lasting mean? These are literally Webster Dictionary definitions. Lasting is enduring or able to endure over a long period of time. And connections is a relationship with a person, thing, or idea that is linked. So to me, really lasting connections isn't just creating kind of friendships one-off or creating connections whether it be friendships or business one off, but really creating them long term. That's that lasting, I think, is the key here. I would I would guess that a lot of you probably know how to connect with others, but it's that deeper level of a lasting connection, kind of a connection that goes past just the superficial layer that goes into deeper territory, even just in terms of listening to each other and being there for each other, as well as lasting more than say a year even. So lasting connections, why are, what are the benefits here? So emotionally, they help reduce your risk of depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, secondary to many different events and anxiety disorders. There's actually good research that shows physically they boost your immune system, improve your prognosis with chronic health conditions and help lower your blood pressure. I mean, that's pretty good. <laughs> A couple other fun facts that I found that and that I thought I was just like so surprised. Did anyone out there know and feel free if you want to share in the chat that poor quality social support. So not having social support around you and not having support is the mortality risk equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Or that's one. Did you know or that supportive friendships in your 20s and 30s are a solid predictor of being alive at 70. So this isn't to say if you don't have social support, you're, you know, this is more just kind of correlation, not causation, but the correlation is kind of showing that social support is really important for long-term physical, mental, and emotional health and connections in general. Feeling connected to people, um, connected to each other is really important for our physical, mental, and emotional health. And actually, before I go into why we're not making them, I do want to say with this here that, you know, we are, as human beings, social beings. And that doesn't mean that, you know, social can mean a, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But social beings mean that we are meant to interact with the world. We are meant to look at people's faces, to talk. Our nervous system, deep within us, kind of our nervous system is what keep up, keeps us alive our nervous system is wired to respond to social cues. So we look for people's facial expressions. We listen for the intonation of their voice. 
we crave being around other humans because as not only a society, but as a human race, that is what we're wired for. We're wired to work together. If you think about our ancestors many, many, many moons ago, we are wired to really be social beings and to thrive off of that connections that we make. You know, back in, you know, I'm talking caveman days, if you didn't have social support, you would have a much harder time at surviving because so much of life was built around that community support. And while that we don't have that same kind of like hunter gatherer experience, we still crave that community support and that lasting connection of knowing people will be there. So I want to talk a little bit first about some of the reasons why you might not be making lasting connections because I found like this was very interesting. I know myself when I was reviewing this research was thinking, hmm, why have I not had some, uh, some connections haven't been lasting and some have lasted? And how has that shifted over the course of my life, whether I be a child, 20s, 30s, and later in life? So kind of the top five reasons that the research was showing that you're not making connect, lasting connections is that you're not really truly connected to your authentic self. And we'll dive a little bit deeper in a moment. But really what that means is that if you're not being who you are and owning up and owning your kind of power and your personality, um, what you like, your passions, what motivates you, what inspires you, it's really hard to make quality connections because then you're always trying to connect with people based on what you think they need or what you think that they like and eventually it's hard to kind of keep up that facade that act of oh uh, being interested in something only because that person is or only because you think that person is so lasting connections really come from being connected to your true authentic self and then meeting and getting to know people who kind of match up to your true authentic self as well and having common traits or common interests or common passions so that's kind of number one Number two is always focusing on the negative, whether that be of a person or a situation. As you know, there's a lot of negativity out in the world, and there's a lot of, I think it, it's easy to focus on the negative things because it's easy to kind of spiral into um, all the negatives of the situation in a person. And I first want to talk about a person. So when you're only focusing on, say, the negative thing of a person, say, I don't know, I'm going to give a silly example, like they're messy. Um, and that might be something that bothers you, but you're not also then looking at all the other things that make this person a great connection to have or a great social support. So while, yes, they may be messy, are they really supporting you? Are they being there for you in times of need? Things like that. So that's a really important thing to look at internally. Are you always focusing on negative? <coughs> Excuse me. My allergies are acting up. Are you always focusing on negative things within a person, whether that be a personality trait or um, or something you deem not uh, perfect for that connection? And then in terms of the situation, if you're always harping on negatives of situations, it can be really hard to make genuine connections when you're only focusing on the negative, especially if someone else is trying to shift their perspective more to the positive. And then number three is you never listen. And never, I think, is a strong word, but you don't listen. And we're going to go through some journal prompts at the end to kind of do some reflection on this. But listening is really a key to making lasting connections and truly listening, not just hearing, because I do think there's a difference between hearing and listening. But, I, but there's a really important distinction there. And when you're really listening, you're actively listening, you're responding to what someone's saying, you're absorbing and well, you don't necessarily have to have empathy for every single thing that someone goes through, but you have compassion and you, you come to the conversation with compassion and getting ready to listen and to understand and to be there fully for the person. And then another one that I thought was really interesting was you spend time with people who treat you poorly. A lot of times we spend, we stick in a connection, a friendship, even a business partnership, maybe even a relationship, even though people are treating us poorly. And it's, it's, kind of that 
theory that like attra- that like attracts like if you're tr- if you're spending time with one person that treats you poorly then you're just inviting in more people that are going to treat you poorly and not saying it's your fault by any means that someone treats you poorly but just that it's important to kind of assess who you're spending time with and if this is the connection that you want to make the friendship the business partnership things like that is this really what you want and is this serving your greater potential potential and your true authentic self So I thought this was a really, really interesting quote. And basically, what it says, and I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, feel free to read it if you'd like, um, but I know you can read the slides, is that the reason why a lot of human beings fail to create real connections with others is that they're not being real within themselves first. So if you want a real connection, you have to be real with yourself, because then you're a genuine anchor to what you want to be. People see themselves or pretend to be things that they're not, and then they're really surprised that they don't create these relationships with other people. You have to really be who you truly are in order to attract relationships, friendships that you really want. And then you attract people that really like who you are and not like the fake you. Um, So that kind of leads us into some important qualities, kind of personality traits for creating lasting connections. When people are looking at creating lasting connections or or looking for people to connect with, these are the top three things that they're looking for. Authenticity, which we've talked about a lot already and we'll continue to talk about, how you, being how you are and not how you should be. And then truthfulness. It's valuable and necessary for healthy connections. Are you truthful not only with yourself, but also with other people around you. People value when they can trust you and when they can confide in you and when you're being truthful about who you are and what your needs are. And then gratitude. I mean, who out there doesn't love to be appreciated? When it comes to making a lasting connection, expressing gratitude is integral to maintaining these connections over the course of time. Because what you know, you find is that over time, it's easy to lose that sense of gratitude that you might find in the beginning when you're like, wow, I'm really happy I met this person. I'm going to tell them. And after a couple of months, years, it doesn't become as obvious to express that gratitude. And that can just be, not that that can cause a relationship to fall apart, but that can be an integral missing part when you see that connections are kind of um, withering away or, or slowing down. So since we've talked about authenticity a lot already so far, I want to go through a couple ways of how to really be authentic. Because I think sometimes it's like, okay, if I want to make a lasting connection, I have to be authentic. But what does that mean? How do I know I'm not being authentic? How do I know I am being authentic? So a couple of different things you can do here. Number one, notice your feelings and check in with where they're coming up from or why they're coming up. And do so without judgment, but with awareness of the situation. So this might be something as simple as a stressful day at work or how you feel about a certain situation or a certain topic. Notice how you feel about things and and why, kind of where that feeling comes from, where that um, experience comes from. Because a lot of times we have ideas, we have thoughts, and we're not really sure where they come from. And they could be someone else's, or they could just be because we thought them the whole time. And when we reflect, we're like, oh, that's not really true to who I am anymore. How can I find feelings, thoughts that are more true to who I am? And another really fun one is making time for solo activities. So really exploring what lights you up. And I'd almost bet that when exploring solo activities, you might bump into a lot of people along the way who are also interested in those activities, which can be a really fun place to start building connections. So for me this summer, it looked like hike, doing a lot of solo hiking and, and sharing that with people like, oh, I just went on this solo hike. And I found more and more people who were interested in hiking than I originally thought. That's just a simple example, but can be really helpful to... Um, give context. And then really be more compassionate with yourself, first and foremost. In order to express compassion and kindness to the greater world, we first need to turn that into ourselves and turn inward. If we're, you know, if we're in a situation where we might not have handled like we wanted to or things came up, can you show yourself compassion, forgive and forget and move on? Because when you can do that with yourself, you can more easily do that with others. 
And then keeping a journal and keeping track of what's going on with your life is a really great way to just see how your ideals, your priorities, your values have shifted and changed. And just notice over time how you have changed as a person. Because your authentic self isn't, you know, stuck in a little box 24-7. Your authentic self is going to evolve and transform and change. And, and that's awesome. And that's amazing. And that's what it should be. But sometimes we get caught up in, you know, the, the I call it like the carry of yesteryear, like the carry that used to be. I'm trying so hard to be her, even though that's not maybe who I am anymore. And it can be hard to see how much we've changed. And then kind of the next two go hand in hand. Explore your passions and what inspires you and take pride in what you love. Own it. If you are really into, oh, I don't know, Star Wars, own that. If you're really into Harry Potter like me, own that. Those are, once again, kind of just silly examples of how of things that you can own. There's many other things. If valuing family, valuing um, being outdoors, if those are important pieces of who you are, truly own it and show up to that in each relationship and each connection that you come to. So here are some of the top tips on making lasting friendships. So like we talked in the beginning, There are many physical, mental, and emotional benefits to having lasting connections. Make it a health issue. It is important for your mental, physical, and emotional health to create supportive connections. And just like, you know, you exercise or maybe you meditate or maybe you eat healthy to take care of your health, reaching out and creating lasting connections is a part of that integral health. And then embracing quality over quantity. I think when we're young, it's easy to gather lots of little friends all over the place. But as we get old, those friendships can kind of fall to the wayside. And that's okay because we all transition and change. But can you focus on building a couple of quality connections instead of having 55 different friends that you can call on? And then I kind of alluded this already, but sticking through that transition. It's really easy to lose friends as we get older, especially when we all go through different life transitions as we Um, as we get older and as life shifts but there's if you can have a couple of quality friends and connections that you can ride through the tough life transitions even if you're not going through the same transitions at at the same time that can be really helpful for making lasting connections and then honestly accepting that you might have to try more than once making friends takes effort creating connections take effort and sometimes it's going to fail sometimes it's not going to work out and that is a o Hey, don't beat yourself up. Accept that that happens and move forward. Building community is also a really important way to get out there and make lasting connections. Being a part of something bigger yourself, doing something for something more than just your personal gain can help create lasting uh, lasting connections, not only with one person, but with your community at a large. And then focusing on the follow-up. First meetings are easier than diving deep. It's It's super helpful to, you know, put yourself out there and meet lots of new people. But first meetings, hey, how are you? What do you like? They're super surface level. Diving deep and being there for the tough time and coming to the next thing, it takes follow-up. It takes practice. It takes being there. And then kind of the downfall, I think, of everyone, the cell phone or social media or Facebook or Instagram, avoid getting stuck in your tech. Don't get me wrong, social networking is great. Being able to connect with people via the internet has been really helpful. Virtual things have been really, really helpful over time, especially during this past year and a half. But don't get lost in only doing that. Face-to-face or voice-to-voice or even having virtual kind of Zoom meetings versus just texting or reaching out via social media really helps build relationships. Like I mentioned earlier, we're social beings. We connect with each other through our voice, through our facial expression. So that face-to-face and voice-to-voice is really important. And then keep it going. Once you establish a connection that you want to keep, can you keep it going by picking maybe a standing time? Hey, what, on the fourth Saturday of every month, we always have brunch or, you know, we always check in once a week on Tuesdays. You know, any, whatever interval works for you, but really keep that friendship going by putting in that extra effort of scheduling something. And then ditching, we kind of talked about this already, ditching negative or poisonous friendships. Not everything is going to be perfect. You might come across connections and people that no longer serve you or that are not serving your authentic self. It is okay to end friendships and end 
connections when they are not what you need and they are not serving your physical, mental, and emotional self. So I love this quote by Misty Copeland. Anything is possible when you have the right people there to support you. I think there's a lot to be said about community, about connections, and about being in touch with other people to support you and lift you up, not only when things are going good to celebrate with you, but when things aren't going so great. I honestly think it's even more important to have people around you when things aren't going great. So a little touch on communication styles. So these are just the four, four common communication styles that are seen in, in, in any sort of connection. This can be any sort of connection or relationship, but there's aggressive, which is often loud. People on the receiving end are dealing with another person who's really behaving aggressively and they may feel really hurt or defensive. Then there's passive aggressive, which is kind of under the surface, a little cunning and controlling. A lot of people dealing with passive aggressive communication style will probably feel hurt and confused and resentful. Like they're not sure what's going on. Passive is just submissive. And I think passive is actually where a lot more of those poisonous friendships fall into. Someone feels they're powerless or that they can't win or that no matter what they say in a connection, they're going to be wrong. Um, and those are probably the one, the communication style that is most kind of hard to end that connection, but most important too. And then assertive. Assertive is kind of the ideal style when trying to create lasting connections. And it honestly goes back to being your authentic self and being truthful. It has a balance between passive and aggressive communication, and it's really the healthiest way to communicate. So how do you communicate assertively in a, any sort of relationship, especially a friendship? Ask directly for what you want and what you need. Take ownership for how you feel. Instead of saying, you're making me feel, say, I feel this way. Tell the other person what those feelings are. We can't, a pa a kind of a passive or a passive aggressive way of communicating is assuming that someone else knows how you feel or how, what you want. You know, say you're supposed to go out to dinner with a friend and they cancel on you and you really needed their support. Not, instead of saying, it's okay, saying, Hey, I really needed support. I know that you can't go di go to dinner anymore, but would you have any chance to jump on a phone call? I'm really struggling here and can use to talk to someone. Keeping your co voice calm and a normal pitch is also super important. As I mentioned earlier, we respond to intonation, whether we realize it on a subconscious level, whether we realize it or not. And then posture is super important. We do a lot of reading of what someone feels like by looking at their posture, are their arms crossed, is their brow furrowed, are they turned away, are they looking at us? And then really eye contact, that face to face, that knowing that someone has your undivided attention is so, so important for building lasting relationships. Beautiful. So um, there are so many different types of kind of personality types out there and things that you can kind of look at. This, we're going to kind of breeze through personality types just because um, it, there's 16 different ones for this specific one. And I just want to give you a touch. And I know that not everyone out there might know their personality types. So there's a Meyer Briggs personality type test, and this is, has a lot of research on it. So I just kind of picked out some of all of the different types and their, pers their relationship superpower. So this might be something you want to look at after taking the test, the Meyer Briggs personality test to see where you fall. But the important thing here is the ISTJ, their superpower is commitment. They're really committed to what they do. They prefer organization. They're very responsible and logical. Then there's the defender, the ISFJ. They are really great listeners. And so basically what this personality type, this one here, followed by their relationship superpower, that's those are things that you can harness in order to make really great lasting connection. So um, moving on to the kind of the advocate, the INFJ, they're really sensitive. They can use their sensitivity to their advantage when connecting with others, really understanding. The INTJ, the architect, is a really healthy, a really great at healthy confrontation, kind of that assertive communication of being honest with what they need and why when things aren't going well, they're great at kind of putting it out there. This is what's going on. And then we have the virtuosa, the ISTP, they are really great at respect. They respect everyone around them, no matter what's going on. They respect the world. They're really great at observing the world and respecting what kind of needs to happen for a relationship to unfold. 
then you have the ISFP, the adventurer. Their, their superpower is really appreciating beauty all around them, appreciating the small things, finding joy in the small things. And they can bring that when creating connections and friendships. Then we have the INFP, the mediator. They're great at offering support. These are the people that you go to when you need a listening ear. They're passionate, they're loyal and committed, and they listen to you no matter what. We have the INTP, the, I can't, I'm not going to say this right, so I'm not going to say it. I don't know why that word always trips me up, but bravery. They put themselves out there and they pride themselves on being unique and they bring that bravery to new relationships by putting themselves out there, by going the extra mile. Am I really connecting when they're in a vulnerable way? And then we have the ESTP, the entrepreneur. They're really good at being spontaneous and bringing that kind of fun, spontaneous nature to connections. And we have the ESFP. I feel like I'm just saying letters, but they do stand for something. I just don't, I don't want to waste their time breaking each down. Um, the entertainer, they are really great with emotional strength. They have great emotional strength and great at working towards a collective goal and their emotional strength can really be brought into connections and harnessed to create a deeper connection. We then have the campaigner, the ENFP. They are devoted above anything else. They're looking for deeper meaning. They're great at reading people and getting to know people and being devoted to those they care about. And we have the ENTP, the debater. They're amazing at communicating as well. They're outspoken, but they're really good at reading people. So they're really good at communicating and understanding other people's reasoning. And we have the ESTJ. I swear there's only 16. <laughs> we'll get through them all. The executive. They're really good at making decisions. They're decisive and practical. They can provide you really clear advice and guidance, and they're really great in leadership roles. The council, the ESFJ, they're really reliable, they're social creatures, and they prefer conversations that really matter. And they're really reliable, they're there when you need them. We have the ENFJ, the protagonist. They are growth and natural born leader. They push you to grow. They work to help others to fulfill their potential. So this is the friend that's always cheering you along and always getting you you know, to push to the next level, to do the next thing, to be the best you can be. Then we have the commander, the ENTJ, willpower. They have confidence and charisma, and they are also great leaders, and they're really good friends. In, in, the, in and every, you know, anyone out there can be really great friends, but these are kind of everyone's kind of superpowers. Uh, and I think that was all. I might have, I'm just making sure I didn't miss one for you all. Oh, I did miss the defender. Oh, no, I said that. Um, they're really great listeners. Um, and the, uh, the logist, oh, I can't say this one as well. Commitment, a logistician. Uh, they're really great at committing. So those are 16 different personality types here. And like I said, you can take the Myers-Briggs personality test. It's a free test online. And these are just a couple ways to kind of look at how can I harness my innate personality traits for making better connections. With that said, there is no like one size fits all. If you, you know, if you take the personality test and you're a campaigner, but you don't, um, the, you know, or the debater and you don't feel like that's you, that's okay. It's not the end all be all. They're just ways to kind of guide you into understanding your personality traits and how to harness them. And then last but not least, I want to do a little touch on how to build lasting connections in work and business. Because we need to not only create connections in our personal lives, but our professional lives. And here are some of the top tips, and you'll see some overlap here um, that the research states. So really focusing on we less than me. So that community aspect at work, focusing on less about me, 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 me succeeding. And us, how can we as a company, as a group, as a team succeed? And then using forms of personal communication, the research really shows that leaders or coworkers that kind of hide behind emails to go through tough information and avoid human content, that they have um, not as well established connection in work and business. So when you need to have a conversation with someone, maybe it's something, a tough conversation or just an in-depth conversation, getting in front of them instead of sending the email across the way or picking up the phone and calling them. And then asking questions about other people's 
experiences. You know, getting to know the people you're working with. Be obsessed. I love this. Be obsessively interested in other people. Really get to know people and what makes them tick. What motivates them? What inspires them? And this kind of leads into the next point is learn what their expectations are at work. So it's learning not only like what they're experiencing and how they work through things, because then you can better harness each other in a work setting, but also what their expectations are. What does this project mean to them? How is this person motivated? How do they learn best? What inspires them to show up every day to work? Why do they get out of bed in the morning? This can help us better understand what makes people tick and be there for them in tough times. And then intensify your intention is all to say, focus on the person in front of you. Pay undivided attention. Don't be having a conversation with someone while checking your email and flipping through a book over here. Focus on the person in front of you. And then increase your empathy. Great leaders, people who make great connections, are aware that people may see things differently and are willing to listen and to understand. Um, while that doesn't mean you have to always bow or bend to other people's ideas or how they feel, you can still listen and understand while taking your own stance. And then putting other people's needs in front of your own, that kind of goes back to that community piece of getting to know people, of working together as a unit. And back to gratitude once again, same in work and business, giving generous amounts of recognition. Hey, so-and-so, thank you so much for your help on your project. I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you so much for listening. I, I'm so glad we worked through that problem together. People crave to be recognized and to be heard. It's an important part of creating lasting connections personally and professionally. Couple last little thing here, couple of journal prompts here if you wanna take a screenshot of them. Just some things to think about when creating lasting connections, kind of what are my passions and interests? Am I being authentic? What are important qualities to me in a relationship? How do I show up currently? And taking that Myers-Briggs test and just kind of checking in. So feel free to take a little screenshot of this because these are good ones to refer back to. Otherwise, I'm going to pop off the this, this screen share right now and just open up for a couple of questions if anyone has any questions. Beautiful. Well, I'll stick around for another moment or two. If you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Thank you so much for being here. I really am honored to be here. Have a wonderful, wonderful Wednesday. Bye, everyone. Yes, it will be posted um, shortly.